to welcome back Mike, Bishop Mike Royal this morning uh, to bring God's Word to us. Thank you so much for last night. Well, yesterday in general, you were working hard sharing God's Word with us and helping us to see more of God's heart. And uh, for those that don't know Mike, he is currently uh, the General Secretary of Churches Together in England. And actually, in your previous roles, you kind of demonstrated that real heart for mission and community engagement. And now you have this role which gives you real insight and reflects your heart, I think, appreciating the the, the breadth and the richness of the Christian family uh, of God's church and uh, we're really just looking forward it's a great combination that heart for mission and heart for the breadth and beauty of God's church so let's just pray for you as you bring God's word to us mm. loving God we thank you for Mike we just pray now that you'd anoint him afresh with your Holy Spirit Lord together we want to hear from you I pray that he would be hearing from you as much as us all hearing from you Lord we stand together under your lordship, looking at your word together, wanting to see you more clearly and wanting to reflect that in our own discipleship and our own walk. Lord, speak to us, encourage us, inspire us, challenge us, we pray. We open our lives and our churches and our movement to you. Thank you that you are on the move and that you are on the move here now through Mike in us. Amen. Amen. And bless you. Thank you. Well, it's um, lovely again to be um, with you. And today I'm going to speak. Can you just drop the mic a little bit? Thank you. Today I'm going to speak on mission is done together. Yesterday you would have heard Reverend Kang Sang Tang refer to John 17 and how John starts started off kind of in ministry as saying that the Great Commission was the most important verses in the Bible, but towards the end of his ministry actually said that actually John 17 for him was key. And that is going to be my focus here this morning. I think if you want people to remember something, you leave the most important thing to say until last. And Jesus prayed this prayer to his father in front of his disciples before he went to the cross and gave his life for the world. Jesus did not want his disciples to forget the words in this prayer. And he knew the challenge that they would face in the coming days. And we see some of those challenges um, displayed in the book of Acts. And I think that the words that Jesus speak in this prayer, that they might be one as we are one, are some of the most important words that Jesus spoke. When you examine the passage that has been read, there are three things in particular that jump out to me, and there is so much more in there. Firstly, Jesus prays that the 12 disciples would stay true to the gospel while speaking truth to the world. True to the gospel, while speaking truth to the world. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Secondly, he prays for us yet to be born, that we might know the same oneness that Jesus knew with his father. Jesus says in this prayer that all of them may be one with the father just as you are in me and I in you. And then finally, our unity as believers will be a sign to the world that Jesus loves them too and wants them to experience the Father's love. 
Jesus prayed, that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know the Father sent Jesus and the Father loves the world as much as the Father loves his Son, Jesus. I've added the Father and Jesus' name into those verses so we understand that Jesus is saying to us that our unity, our oneness, is a demonstration of the fact that the Father loves the world. And of course we know that our earthly fathers, our earthly parents, haven't always been great. You may be here this morning, and your experience of your own earthly father or mother might not be a positive one. But when we speak of the love of the Father as outlined in Scripture, we are talking about a God who demonstrates his love towards us in giving Christ on the cross for the world. And so at the start of this assembly, we started um, with the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, but we are going to finish with the new commandment, John 13, 34. Love one another as I have loved you. The takeaway from me from the passage that we've read is this. We will only reach the world if we do it together. We're not going to do it in silos. We're not going to do it by shouting at each other. We're definitely not going to do it by shouting at each other on social media. We're not. And this is one of the reasons why I felt so called to this role at Churches Together in England. For me, this is what keeps us standing together. And this morning, I want to just share with you an, a number of what I describe as ecumenical principles that will help us to continue to walk and to journey together for the sake of the world. Firstly, I think it's really important that we make a distinction between important issues and essential issues. At Churches Together in England, I'm currently going through the process of leading two uh, denominations to become members of CTE. And that decision is taken by our membership um, body of, 30, of, of 52 different national denominations. And for us, there are two essentials as to whether you will qualify to become a member of CTE or not. Firstly, it's your belief and understanding in the nature of God, Yahweh, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And secondly, it's the person of Christ, God the Son, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world. Beyond those two issues, everything else is important. There are other things are important, but we consider those absolute essentials. And so what I want to encourage us in this moment is, is that beyond those essentials, that we, yes, focus on the important theological issues, but we stay together as we work them through. That's the first point I want to make. The second for me is this, that we use some principles of what we describe as receptive ecumenism to work through those issues. What is receptive ecumenism? Well, what it is, 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 a, it's, is a, a, an approach whereby we approach one another with a disposition that simply says, I want to learn. I want to hear from you, I want to learn, and I want to understand. It can help us hugely to deal with the difficult issues of human sexuality, of human dignity, and of equal 
marriage. And we can use those principles to deepen our understanding of the different theological positions we might have. It's all based on having a disposition that says, I am going to approach you with a sense of lack and that I can only be complete when I receive from you and you can only be complete when you receive from me. It involves deep listening. It also involves receptive hearts. For over 15 years now, for about 15 years, I have been a mental health chaplain just part-time um, in uh, um, Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Foundation Trust. And the biggest lesson I've learned being a chaplain is, is that actually is listening to people is the best way in which you can serve them. And the whole idea of receptive ecumenism is not to necessarily come to a place of agreement, but to come to a place where we understand each other more deeply. That we stay, uh, that we commit to stay at the table and we keep listening, we keep receiving, we keep reflecting and we keep loving and embracing. The third thing I want to say is this, is, is that we commit to walk together even when there is profound disagreement. You remember in the book of Acts that Paul had a disagreement with, with Barnabas. They had a disagreement, a fallout over John Mark. And the Bible says is that they separated their separate ways. But read later on in the epistles, who does God, who does um, Paul call for? He calls for John Mark, when all, everyone in his ministry has gone their separate ways. I wonder if Paul would have achieved so much more if perhaps he had been able to work out his disagreement with Barnabas. I don't know, but I often ask myself that question when I read the narrative of Scripture. At Churches Together in England, we are the instrument of the church that helps it to walk together in unity. But I want to say that there have been times when that journey has been extremely painful. It has taken great personal cost and it has been at great personal cost to some denominations as well. I want to say that we haven't always done it well and we are absolutely committed to doing it better as we step forward into the future. But I keep reminding myself of the prayer of Jesus, that we all might be one as Jesus and the Father are one. We choose not to sweep it under the carpet. We choose not to ignore the pain of some of those conversations. We keep acknowledging it. We keep talking about it. We keep talking about the issues that matter. We have committed to one another that we will live with disagreement well and keep having those necessary conversations. And this morning I want to call you to continue to do that. It is a beautiful thing when people on the opposite side of a, a theological position can embrace each other and even shed tears in each other's arms because they love one another and refuse to allow that issue to divide them. I did an interview with the past president of Churches Together in England, um, Reverend Dr. Hugh Osgood, 
um, he was the, the previous free church um, moderator. And has recently written a book called Is Kindness Killing the Church? Which is really a call to deeper conversations. And um, he said something in the interview that I have reflected and mused over since I gave that interview some two or three months ago. He said this, sometimes it's helpful to think of unity as a gift rather than a destination. And when he said that, it struck me so hard that I didn't even have a follow-up question because I thought, I don't know what to do with that, but I want to go away and reflect on it. And as I was preparing uh, to speak uh, this morning, the thing that came to me is this, is, is that the thing about a gift is, is that you keep giving it to someone. I keep giving gifts to, to, to my wife on her birthday and at Christmas, and occasionally when I remember flowers, because I know she loves flowers. But you keep giving as a sign of love and a sign of commitment to one another. Our unity is a gift whereby we keep giving of ourselves to one another. And I think committing to walk together is a sign of our unity. It's really easy to walk away. It's really easy to say, well, I don't agree with your position, so I'll go my separate way. That's quite easy. But maturity comes when you can sit down, where you can open your heart, where you can listen to others, where you can receive from them and they can receive from you. And actually, we begin then to reflect come to a new understanding and act in a new way. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13 says this, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Christ. That is God's vision for his church. One of the things I, I love is I love to see churches doing stuff together. And, and actually, as a, a Christian and as a, a minister, I've committed many years of my life to churches working together to transform society. It's great to see up and down the country the many unity movements where churches are coming together and working together. We've seen it in particular with the warm welcome campaign over the, the, the winter period where over 4,000 churches opened their doors to those who were in need. But the one thing that I think sometimes that social ecumenical um, relationships lack is the willingness to sit down and talk about the more difficult issues. But I think it's really important behind the scene as we are working together, but behind the scenes, we are talking about the difficult stuff because that's the glue that will guarantee that we stay together. I want to see that within denominations as well as between denominations. I want to tell you that it has been a tremendous joy for me over the last couple of days to speak at this conference. It isn't platitudes when I say I have the highest regard for the Baptist movement and I think it is pivotal to the future of the Church of Jesus Christ in this country. I often think when I get up in the morning and I go for my walk on the Stratford and Avon Canal, I often think of our different denominations and I, I, I think of the Baptist movement and I, I thank God for your work, not just in the past, 
but where you are today and how you are working in your various communities throughout the UK and, of course, globally, as we've just heard of the work of BMS. But I want to say this. May God give you both wisdom and grace, and I choose those two words carefully as you seek to walk forward. And where you disagree, you commit to doing that well. May God develop in each one of us a heart, an ecumenical heart, an ecumenism of the heart, that deep unswerving commitment to stand together as brothers and sisters in Christ, a passion for the whole body of Christ in all its diversity. And as I stand here next to the communion table, the bread and the wine, which has not very much meaning unless we do it together. As we stand together, we have this opportunity to share communion and to renew our covenant, not just with God, but to renew it with one another. And perhaps in the moment of communion, you might have that opportunity to walk across to someone, perhaps someone who might think differently from you, and share communion with them. And may God remind us, as we leave this conversation, that our diversity is a visible sign of the strength of our unity in Christ. Thank you for listening, and God bless you as a Baptist movement.